Good evening. Thank you all for coming here. Um, and thank Andrew and everybody here at uh, Ace House Fables. Support your local independent bookstore. Yeah, for, for ha hosting it. Um, so what I'm going to do today is kind of like talk about the book that I have um, and a little bit about kind of how the book came to be, you know, a little bit about myself and uh, kind of like, you know, why why I think the music that he performs and is so so unique in so many ways, and how you know I was fortunate to kind of be there at an early stage in his career to capture it. Because um, you know the year was 1974. I want to set the stage here a little bit. Now, what's interesting is 1974. Juicy Fruit was the first product to have a UPC code attached. Steve Stevie Wonder's Intervision was album of the year. Mikhail Baryshnikov defected to Russia and uh, joined the uh, American Ballet Theater. And uh, on the East Coast and around the country, there was a young singer, 24-year-old, who was going up and down playing small bars and clubs, just trying to build an audience, trying to you know, get a name for himself. And it was also a 24-year-old photographer in Boston and Cambridge trying to build up his credentials as well. <laughs> Yeah, um, but you know, I was very fortunate to live in Boston in the 70s because it was, uh, and still is today, a very vibrant music community, but it was also a very vibrant political community, very vibrant, you know, uh, educational and students, and you know, music was the soundtrack, you know, to all our lives and is what kind of bonded to us. It's what we shared, what we talked about. Um, if any of you grew up in the area, you probably may have heard of WBCN which was the, the station we all lived in and breathed by. And I used to talk about how I remember I, would, I could walk down Mass Ave in Cambridge and pass a number of stores. And uh, everywhere I went, you heard WBCN playing out. And by the way, just a side note, there's a great documentary out right now on WBCN, which, is, which I think aired on locally last weekend. I think it's airing other air, around the country this weekend as well. Um, it's called WBC and the American Revolution. And it's, it's a really good story. I actually have a moment or two in it. You know, but um, it, it's a fascinating look at that era and how literally a bunch of crazy kids put together a radio station and just kind of broke all the rules. You know? But it, it's really a good, a good story. And there's actually a book coming out too, by the way. It's a complimentary book. You know? But, you know. Anyway, but um, I always had my camera with me. And I always was kind of going around and capturing it stuff. And as I said, music was a big part of my life. And I was actually working as a member of the Fine Arts Department at Emerson College. And when I was there, um, I met a student named Ira Gold. Ira is there on the left. And Ira and his partner, Jeff Hirsch, uh, were concert promoters in the area. Now, Jeff Hirsch and his partner, Dick Waterman, were body rates management team at the time. And so they would do body shows, and they did a lot of other shows in the area. And um, it was interesting because Jeff handled the business side of their concert business and Ira handled the booking side. And Ira was always looking for new and unknown acts to put on, on stage and where, where Jeff would find the more established acts you know, to book and negotiate stuff. He was, the, he was Bonnie's business manager. Um, and I got to know them and I said, I'd love to you know, photograph your acts when they, when they come through town. They said, say, sure. So I mean, it was a great time. You know, I uh, photographed people like Van Morrison. Um, this was, I think, a show in Cambridge, and he actually lived in Cambridge for quite a while. He actually wrote Astral Weeks here when he lived here. Um, Boz Skaggs, uh, Paul Butterfield, and um, he was really one of the greats. But it was really an amazing time because the access and the informality of kind of the music environment, the concert environment, was something that sadly is gone. Um, but, you know, as a photographer, I had like this sort of access and just to kind of roam around. This is kind of thing in the afternoon at, at a sound check rehearsal is Jackson Brown and Bonnie Ray just hanging out talking. And, you know, I would just sit there and talk and hang out and kind of got to know everybody. And it just, there was just, we, there was a sense that kind of like, you know, that we were kind of all kind of doing things together. We we're all sort of figuring it out. Um, you know, I could walk around, hang out backstage, talk to, you know, to hang out with Boss Skaggs. That was the, People were still smoking cigarettes then. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is Jackson Brown during a, during a set check, during a sound check, a rehearsal. Um, 
But what was interesting was, you know, I'm just obviously just standing on the stage, just talking and taking photos. Um, there was no sense of this great divide between artist and audience. It's kind of like they were all coming into their own as we, as the audience, were kind of all becoming part of this culture and evolving. Um, you know, it was very relaxed. And, and when I kind of went through my photos and I came across this, this shot, one of the things that really was interesting to me was, you know, okay, here's a shot during sound check. And then during the actual show, uh, here's a shot of Jackson at the piano, and he's got a white shirt on. And I realized that after the shot that this is actually during the show, not during a rehearsal. And I'm literally standing next to the bass player on the stage, just taking photos of the thing. It's like, that's just how it was. You know, everybody was just hanging out, you know, enjoying the fact they're all doing that. You know, music was, like I said, something that we, we lived and talked about and we shared. There's no internet. So if we shared music, we lent somebody an album and we hope we got it back, you know? <laughs> and that was kind of the way, way things were. Um, but whenever it's somebody was new, we were talking about WBCN earlier, you got really excited about a new act and you wanted to tell your friends all about it. Uh, musicians, in my sense, during that time, were really the disruptors of the stage. We hear the, we hear the term the disruptors a lot, people who would change things. But a new act, a new sound, a new fresh sound would really kind of change things and make people talk and make people wake up. So, you know, I, had a, I was living in Brookline, and I had a roommate, and he brought home these records one day, and he said, I, I've heard this guy, is supposed to be pretty good. So we, we, we put him on, we listened to him, and I said, geez, I kind of like the grooves here, kind of some jazz influences, rapid fire, you know, uh, uh, singing the songs, with a lot of poetry in his music, and I said, this is really unique, very different. So we wanted to go see him live, and he was playing locally in the bars at Cambridge then, and uh, just to kind of show you kind of, you know, how new he was, he was playing over at Joe's place in Cambridge, and he was still kind of unknown, they couldn't even get his name right, Bruce Springsteen, you know, versus Springsteen, you know. And, uh, you know, he still was just, you know, he'd come here, play for a few nights, go to the town, play a few nights, come back for a few nights. And um, so, you know, we went to see him, you know, at, at another place called Charlie's Place. And I remember going in there, it was a tiny venue. It was on a street called uh, Bow Street in uh, Cambridge, right from Mass Maverick for Harvard Square. And walk in and one of the things that I notice is the place is pretty full, kind of surprised because I'm thinking this guy's not really well known. The band is set up in a corner. I'm not going to exaggerate. The band was set up in an area that's a half, maybe a third the size of this room here. And they, six people all next to each other. There's like peanut shells on the floor. Those the typical wooden benched back, you know, uh, booths, you know, pitcher of beer for two bucks. And, you know, there's, we sit down with a couple of friends, and there's a couple people sitting in front of us. And I'm kind of looking around. I kind of comment. I said, geez, there's a lot of people here. And this guy who's across from us says, you mean you've never heard him before? And I said, no, nah, no, I haven't. He goes, oh, man. He goes, I'm from Philadelphia. I've been following him up and down the East Coast. You wait. I first thought, I thought, why, why would you do that? <laughs> you know, why would you come up here from Philadelphia to see it, you know? Well, anyway, the bottom line was, within a few hours, I knew why. I clearly felt that I had heard, uh, really at the time, uh, the best music I'd ever heard in my life. I, I never had heard anything like that. The way he, his stage persona, the way the band worked, the sound, the tightness, it was just, I just came out of it going, I have to hear this band again. I have to hear him. So, uh, you know, I called my friend Ira, and I said, you, you got to put this guy on. you got to put this guy on one of your shows. And he'd never heard of him, so he comes over to my house. I play him. The albums, he says, can I borrow them to go give them to Jeff to listen to, his part there? And I knew that was goodbye to the records. I said, yeah, go ahead, do that. And so he and Jeff met with Bruce, went to Bruce the following night. They met with him, you know, and they offered him an opportunity to, to play. And uh, out of that meeting at, the, at Charlie's Place at the bar, you know, came, came this show. Now, Jeff and Ira and Dick Waterman, being Monty's management team, um, I know you probably saw the ticket price, right? Four dollars. I, I know that's what you just saw. Yeah, think about that. You know, four bucks, huh? Anyway, um, Bonnie at the time was, was doing well. She was very popular, very popular in the Northeast. Um, she had been touring with Jackson. She was opening for Jackson. Well, she was touring mostly as an opening act. Um, her management wanted to give her a night of her own. They wanted her to be the only act, the headline act, you know, do it in her hometown. 
They had done the Harvard, they had done the Van Morrison show at the Harvard Square Theater. They thought this was a good venue, perfect one. So it was going to be just Bonnie's night. But when they saw Bruce, they said, "How'd you like to open it up for Bonnie?" And he was like, "Yeah, sure, you know, whatever." I mean, he was really kind of, you know. So he, they literally paid him the band five hundred dollars for two sets, you know, uh, to, to play that night. So I was excited. This is great. You know, I tell all my friends, I literally reserve a row of seats for all my friends, and I get there early in the afternoon for the sound check, and I get down there, and um, one of the things I kind of notice is, you know, I, look, I haven't gone to a lot of shows this time, I haven't been there and, record, and photographed a lot of concerts, I kind of knew the drill, and a lot of times when bands do sound checks, okay, can I hear the monitor, it sounds good, play a couple of tunes, sounds good, okay, let's go get dinner. Yet, when he had his turn for sound check, they were up there for like almost like 45 minutes. He was rehearsing them. He was doing different songs. You know, he was single him, you know, and, and there was a sense of seriousness in what was going on that I hadn't seen before. And what was interesting was, um, uh, you know, some time later as I worked in the book, then I got to talk to some of the band members, you know, both uh, uh, Boom, the drummer, and uh, Gary, the bass player, both had said, even, and David, the pianist as well, had said to me, yeah, it was business with him. Oh, it was good, but you know, it was you know he was rehearsing us. It, it was it was all tight. Um, they also knew that there was a a music critic in the in the in the room that night, and so Bruce knew that uh, John Lando was there, and John Lando was writing for Rolling Stone at the time, and also writing for the local Cambridge paper, the Real Paper, and so he knew he wanted to do, to do a good show. Um, there was really a sense that there was a purpose in what they were doing. And he was very passionate that he really wanted to do it right. You know, so when he opens the show, you know, the lights dim and he comes out there. And I remember I, I talked about the term disruptor earlier. Here's a guy playing to an audience. Maybe a third of them know who he is. The rest of them are there to see Bonnie Raitt. He's known to be a rock and roll act. He opens up with the song New York City Serenade, which is this beautiful classical piano opening, a little strum the acoustic guitar, simple single red light on him. And I'm thinking to myself, what is he doing? This is a rock and roll act. People have come here to see rock and roll music, and, and this is it. And I would tell you, within, within 10, 15 seconds, there was, there was like a hush. You couldn't hear a thing in the crowd. He had, he had everybody focused on him. It was the last thing people expected, somebody to start like this. And again, he knew what he was doing. He had a mission. He had something in mind. And there was a sense of just quiet and, in the room and, you know, uh, about what was about to happen. And I remember when I, when, I, when I saw this photo later on, this shot always reminded me a little bit of Elvis. It's got, got, kind of got the look with the guitar. And I, there was a funny story in his book about how when he was, uh, oh, probably 11, 12, he saw Elvis on the Ed Sullivan Show and decided that's what he wanted to do. In front of his game was a guitar. He couldn't play it. Everything wasn't right. He, one day he's fooling around with it. He goes down on his uh, porch in the back of his house. And he starts playing the guitar or playing more like he's playing it, doing the hip stuff. All of a sudden, this crowd of kids comes up, start watching him do it. And as he says in his book, I smelled blood. And he goes, yeah, I knew this was it. This is what I had to do. Um, the, his, his sense of uh, performance struck me, as I mentioned, when I first saw him in the bar. And it, and it really struck me this night at the Harvard Square Theater, he had taken it up a notch. Uh, you know, uh, as someone who's always interested in performance and interested in theater, I, I was really amazed at his use of what I call props. He used this hat as a prop, you know, the way he would use it in different forms, signal it, use it as an accent. You know, I, I always kind of thought that he reminded me of the way he tipped his hat of Frank Sinatra, another, you know, Jersey, Jersey singer. But he had a certain swagger to him that was really unseen. You know, he was, he was simply this, this Jersey kid with the leather shirt, leather, leather jacket, you know, the belt with the buckle to the side and the hat. And I really understood, and if I looked at it, he really understands character and having a character on stage and being that character. And it was interesting because, um, you know, in 2018, you know, when he did uh, Springsteen on Broadway, everybody's talking about how he's on Broadway. You know, and I said, well, he, he know, he's been knowing how to be on Broadway for years. He knows what it's about. You know, he knows how to do it. Uh, the other thing that impressed me so much always about him and his work was um, his ability to be a storyteller. 
Now, as a photographer, I like to think of myself as a storyteller. I like to think that my photos tell stories. He put his stories into his words and into his music. You know, you heard about the people from his upbringing. You heard about Hazy Davy and people like that, Killer Joe, and all the folks that he hung out with on the shore, you know, on summer nights. Um, he had the ability to sort of, you know, take you into his characters and just, you know, make you part of the story. And he would also tell a lot of stories in between the songs. A little less now they used to do it, but he used to go on forever. I remember once being with some friends at one of these shows and someone looking at me going, oh, there he goes, you know, because he would go on and on. But it was funny that night because he was telling the story about how he, um, they had checked in some motel on uh, Route 2, I think, uh, in Concord. And it was just some old hotel. And he talks about how when the, uh, the clerk put the keys on the counter, how they all grabbed for them, you know, thinking one was better than the other. And he walks into the room and literally flicks the light. Fluorescent light is flickering on and off. There's a fly flying around. He looks at the sheets, you know, and the sheets look stained. He swears he walked into a crime scene, you know. You know, it's just, you know, to him that was like, you know, that was the thing. Um, now, um, Boone Carter, his, his drummer at the time, you know, uh, uh, told us a story. It was kind of very fascinating, you know. Um, his real name being Ernest Carter, um, he talked a lot about how uh, serious rehearsals were and about how he was, uh, you know, he was the second drummer in the band, Vinny Lopez being the first drummer, who was eventually fired from the band because he tends to get into altercations with the club managers that t when they're performing. So anyway, uh, uh, Vinny was... Uh, uh, you know, uh, left from the band, David Sanchez was friendly with, with Boom Carter, and so he brought Boom up. Boom was in Atlanta at the time. He brought Boom up to New Jersey because actually Boom, being from Asbury Park, is where David knew him. Boom, Boom was playing in a band in Atlanta at the time. Brought him up and had him, you know, rehearse with the band for one rehearsal, and then they went out and did a gig the next night. And he said, you know, he didn't know any material, but he said all he did is followed. Bruce's rhythms on the guitar because there was so much intricacy in the way he played that he added all these little these little beats in it. And um, just a kind of little funny little side note: people that really get into this part of the era talk about how Boom was on uh, the song "Born to Run." He wasn't on the whole album. And there's a little drum riff he does in the middle of the song during one of the breaks where Max Weinberg has said to the day he cannot replicate the style of snare drum work he did. And I asked Boom, I said, what was that? He goes, what he did is when Bruce is playing a lead, lead guitar riff, he followed the notes, note by note with his beat of the thing. So every time he hits a snare, he's following a note. He just said he followed his music. You know, it's just, it was just pretty amazing. But it's also kind of interesting how he actually got the name Boom. Uh, he was, um, his dad in Asbury Park uh, was a, a photographer for a local newspaper. Uh, might have been Asbury Park Press, I'm not sure, you know. And uh, so he used to cover the music scene, and Boom used to go around to all the clubs with him and, and watch music, and he wanted very much to play music, wanted to play drums. So he got a drum set. He was, he was, he was playing at, the home, at home one day in the basement, rehearsing, and uh, next thing you know, the police showed up. And he asked, why did the police show up? He said, well, we've, been here, we've got rumors we're hearing gunshots here. They were hearing his snare drum, you know. Hence he, became the, hence he got the nickname Boom. Um, David Sanchez, uh, who, was a, who was a pianist at the time, uh, a tremendous talent. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting, what I noticed is when they were doing sound check, when the band all, all walked off stage, David sat at the piano, and he was just playing, and he was doing all this kind of jazz improvisation. And I remember thinking to myself, this guy is a great jazz pianist. You know, why is he in a rock and roll band? And, uh, but he just stayed at the piano for a long time. And I just always wondered about that. So when we were putting the book together and we interviewed David, um, I asked, he said, before I even asked, he goes, and I remember the piano that night. I said, really? I said, I remember you playing it. And he goes, yeah. On this whole, every time they had played at some gigs, because you know, they don't carry a big piano with them. So in their rider, they always request some type of a piano. They always got lousy pianos. He said it was the first night they got a real concert grand piano on the stage, and he didn't want to leave it. You know? So he was amazed that they actually had a real piano that night. Um, I, and, and Gary challenged here. Now, Gary had actually, I mentioned, Gary had played in a band previous to uh, the East Street Band with, um, with Boom and David. And what was interesting was um, they actually had done a small demo uh, of, of this kind of jazz that, that Dave was writing. 
and there was one time when they were actually uh, um, touring where somebody approached David and said, do you still play jazz? And this, somebody from a record label had heard the demo and said, would you like to record an album of your music? Which, of course, he was thrilled about. So he left E Street Band with Boom, and they formed this band called Tone, you know, which was a result of the demo they did with Gary Talent on the bass player at the time. But the um, interesting thing is that um, in talking to all of them about that night, one of the things that uh, Gary had said, that actually Boom had said to me as well, was, you know, following that night, after John Landau's review came out where he said, I've seen the future of rock and roll, and his name is Bruce Springsteen, they all felt really burdened by that quote. They said, that's an awful big thing to live up to. They really felt the burden of that. But Gary, remember him telling me about how fondly he remembers that band. And a lot of people, a lot of people think that was maybe kind of the most interesting band they had at the time because of, of their mix of the, of the jazz and R&B, you know, because at the time, six musicians, three of them white, three in the black, in the early 70s, was really not heard of, and they used to tour the South, and it wasn't always the most comfortable thing. And he said he was very proud of the fact that, you know, they, they definitely, you know, were, were a very integrated act at the time, and they went out there, and it was like, you know, they were very proud of who they were. Uh, Danny Federici, uh, keyboardist at the time, also uh, known, as, known as the Phantom. Um, I kind of love this shot because you're kind of looking right across the stage at him. And he's kind of like kind of looking up, obviously probably looking over at Bruce kind of in this moment. And uh, it kind of makes you kind of what, what he's really thinking about. I say it's probably Bruce because he would change stuff on site. So oftentimes they had to look at him for the cue. But he had a nickname, the Phantom, uh, Danny the Phantom. And I, always, I asked about how that name came about. Well, apparently, when they were in the early stages, they were playing a show in, in, uh, in New Jersey at, at Monmouth, which was Monmouth College at the time. And Dandy was known to sometimes have some altercations with the local law, nothing too big, but, you know, he was just kind of a kid that got in trouble a lot. So the band was playing an afternoon concert, and the word got out that the police were there, and they were going to, they wanted to have a conversation with Dandy, shall we say. And the band, and Bruce, and Bruce knew that they were there. He had got the word. So they were doing some song, you know, some song at the end where they get you know, like twist and shout or something like that, getting way up and dancing. Bruce called all the people up on stage to dance on the stage around the band so you couldn't see anything. And while they're doing that, Dandy slipped down the back stairs, walked, and left away. And when the, and we all walked away, he was gone, the Phantom. And the police kind of said, "All right, that's that's cool. We'll we'll let that one go," you know. Um, and of course, Clarence. Now I was talking earlier about. Uh, the uh, No Nukes film, and one of the things that's really wonderful about that film is you really see the, uh, the bond uh, they had uh, between them. Um, I, look at, I love the shot because it's kind of like Bruce is kind of, this is uh, doing, during New York, City, New York City Serenade as well. You know, Bruce is kind of looking off to the left, off to the right, kind of just drifting, and Clarence is there just kind of rock steady, kind of just saying, you know, I got your back, I got your back. But um, they, they had an incredible bond, which, of course, everybody knew of that when... Uh, when he left us, uh, it was a tremendous loss to him and, and the rest, and all of us, and all the music community for that matter. And uh, we're very happy all to see Jake carrying on. And by the way, in the show, as Jake plays Clarence's saxophone, you know, he plays his, he's his uncle. You know, he play, he, he has the one he uses now to take around with him. Um, one of the things that I loved about his music was also the, um, the kind of, uh, I mentioned kind of the jazz influence, but kind of the unpredictability of some of his songs, and especially some of the earlier stuff during this era, because there's only two albums out at the time. And uh, they, um, the way he will go through sudden changes in the music and build and kind of get quiet. And when I was doing kind of a little research for this book, one of the things that I, uh, I learned was something about how music affects the brain. And this is during uh, Spirit in the Night, song Spirit in the Night. And what happens is, if you listen to something that has kind of a little bit of redundancy, your brain will suddenly get kind of tired. So what he would do is a, a certain rhythm would start, all of a sudden he would shift and go into a different rhythm. And, and when you get a shift happening and the music throws you off, but you're still feeling the beat, you're kind of listening, but you're kind of waiting for something to come back. So your brain is actually building some anticipation. Now, Spirit in the Night, 
has that kind of feel to it, you know, where it kind of bounces back and forth and there's a kind of calling and it brings you back. And what happens is when the original rhythm that was just as a bass starts to weave itself back in, your brain starts to anticipate this coming. And as soon as it comes back to this moment, after it's being kind of all over the place, you know, all of a sudden your brain goes, yes, and there's literally an endorphin release, you know, and you know, suddenly you're like, oh, yeah, and it, the whole audience can feel that kind of rush. Now, I don't think at the time he was a student of chemistry in the brain and figured it out as such, but I do think that he understood that music can move you in a certain way, and if it has these little elements of complexities to it, you really can be taken for a ride. And that was very much part, part of the song Spirit of the Night, which is one of my favorite songs, you know, which leads me to my next little story. So uh, you all know what a Ouija board is, right? So when I was living in Northern California, uh, a friend of mine was over, and uh, she was really into the Ouija board. And she said, I want to bring the Ouija board over. We'll do it one night. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. I was not really a, wasn't a Ouija board disbeliever, but I wasn't like, looking for that to uh, tell me what I should do next in my future. So she puts the Ouija board down, and you know, it's like, hello, Ouija, and it's all doing kind of yes and no, simple things, and I'm just kind of going along with it. And all of a sudden, I literally feel it kind of take a different sense, like all of a sudden it felt different. And the Ouija, that little piece you put your fingers on, is moving from the middle to the moon, the middle to the moon, and it's like really kind of going like this. And I'm thinking, this feels weird. And I could tell she's going, I'm not doing this either, you know? And it's doing it, it's doing it, and I'm going, spirit, moon, spirit, moon. And all of a sudden I realized that the song playing in the background on the radio was Spirit of the Night. It was Spirit, moon, Spirit, Night, Spirit of the Night. I yelled it out, and I swear to God, it was a crackle. My lights flicked on and off. Music came back on. The Ouija board was put away and never taken out again. <laughs> um... At the time, he was getting some airplay in the area, mostly that one song, Rosalita, which was his big barn burner. It was like the big finish to his night. So by the time he got to Rosalita, which was the last song in his set, people, he had the audience now. People knew what they were seeing. It was pretty amazing. And people also knew the song. So at that time, everything was kind of really almost, almost at a fever pitch. Um, it, was, it was really his showstopper the way he would really, you know, bring the audience together and really just, you know, play, play it to the hilt. Now, um, you know, even though that was a big moment in the night, one thing that was also interesting about the night was it was the first time that he played the song Born to Run, which was not called Born to Run at the time. And he played Born to Run because it was a new song. Again, he only had the first two albums out, and he, was, he had a contract with the third album. And... You know, he wanted to premiere the song that night because he knew John Landau was in the audience. He knew someone was writing a review that could have some credit. Now, he had two albums out. The albums were not selling well at all. Getting great reviews, critic, you know, critics' reviews, they were not selling well. As a matter of fact, a lot of cities were not even getting the albums in the record stores. Uh, Boom Ted told me once they were doing a show in Atlanta. He went to the record store, didn't have the records in there. His label, Columbia Records, was starting to get not interested in it anymore. They were starting to think, this, is not, this has been fun, but we're not going to make it. And actually, Billy Joel was now a new artist in their repertoire, and they were telling the radio stations now, they were literally telling the radio stations not to play Bruce Springsteen, but to play Billy Joel. And again, he knew this was happening. The band members knew this was happening. This is why every night when they went out to perform, they had to perform like it was the best show they could ever do and the most important show they ever do, you know, which is still very much what they do today. So knowing that there was an important person in the night, an important person in the audience that night. They wanted to premiere this new song. And Lando does reference the song, you know, in his review by calling it that song with the Telstar guitar intro. Um, it was interesting because some years later, uh, Ira and the people who were producing the show, when they, when they brought him back to Boston to do the show, he was in the process of recording uh, the album Born to Run. And uh, they said to him, listen, we're going to do some radio spots for the show. We need some music to plan to get anything new. He sent them a cassette, a, a demo cassette of Born to Run. At the time, it was called Tramps Like Us. And I was saying, I, he wishes he still could find that cassette somewhere. But that was an early version with a different name to it. So that was, was kind of unique. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sitting there. You know, I'm, I'm at the concert, and I'm you know, kind of enjoying it, you know, taking photos. I'd say about 
almost, you know, I think it's about three quarters of the way to the second set. I say to myself, you know, I'm going to sit down and enjoy this show. I just, you know, I got to take some time. So I'm, I'm, I walk up to the edge of the stage and I sit down on, on the wings, you know, on uh, stage left. And I'm, there's a drum case and I sit on the drum case. I'm just going to sit there and enjoy it. And all of a sudden I see uh, Boom Car get up off the drums. I see Gary unplug his bass and they're walking off stage towards me. And I go, great. I spend my whole night taking pictures. And now the show's over, you know, my luck. So I'm just sitting there. But I notice as Boom and Gary come over, they turn, and they stand right next to me. Gary's got his guitar against his chest, and Boom's got his sticks down here. I don't know what's going on. And then I see Bruce come walking over and sit at the piano, which is three feet in front of me. And my first thought was, I had no idea he played the piano. My second thought was, I'm going to reload my camera. So I take some more film out. This is film now. We shot film back in those days, you know. And I load the film in the camera very slowly, kind of opening it up, putting, threading the film, cranking the advance very slowly. I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to disturb this guy. This is really a beautiful moment, and I got to get the shot, you know. So, and, and it was interesting because I remember like kind of bringing the camera up to my eye, kind of one eye looking at him and one eye looking through the lens, and just kind of myself saying to myself, this is really an, an amazing moment I have right now, you know, kind of watching it. And, and what I love about the photo is one of the things is, there's only two light sources uh, on the stage at the time. There's a light from back here on a, you know, on a light tree, and then there's the light on his, on, on, above the piano, like the, the music sheet, the sheet music light. That's all that's there. Now, back then, we shot with what we had, you know? Um, we didn't really have you know, much, much to you know, work with lighting-wise. You, you shot film, so you shot 36 frames per roll, and you hope maybe you got one shot. And I probably shot, you know, maybe a half dozen rolls that night. But if I got one image on a roll, I'd be very happy. And so you're very careful with every shot. You frame each one. You're very delicate. And I, I kind of tell that because, um, you know, I continued to do work shooting in the concert environment. And I, you know, was out on some of their 2016 uh, River Tour. And when they were in Boston, I remember I was standing next to the uh, Boston Globe photographer. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in this area next to the soundboard. We're kind of up on a small platform. And they, they come on stage, and I'm just kind of shooting. And I, at this time, I, I, I know the set list a little bit, and I kind of know what to expect because I'd seen already a few shows. And all of a sudden, I'm listening to the camera, the camera next to me. The camera's going literally, and he's just firing off shot after shot after shot after shot. I'm thinking to myself, well, gee, you've got to get a good shot if you keep doing this, you know? And I learned later that... Uh, it's a concept that photojournalists use called spray and pray. They literally just fire off a bunch of shots, hope they get the one or two they want. They go backstage after their, their part is done, upload it to the editor, and they're done. Off to the next gig. But uh, I was amazed that that was the style that they were doing. And, and I was very happy that having worked in film, and eventually, you know, I, I shoot digital now as well, that uh, I still would craft my shots and still look at them very delicately and try to frame each one, you know, so it was kind of a, a, an interesting experience. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, you, you work with what you had. Um, you know, like I, I go back to this shot here, you know, he's here in a blur. I mean, you, you know, the film speed could not capture the amount of light, but the way he turns to me and the way there's a little bit of blur in the action, there's a sense of like activity on the stage. There's something happening. It feels alive. And I kind of like that rawness to the look, you know, that Digital photography will not always get this day. I mean, digital photography is great. Sometimes it's so, so realistic looking, it's more than our eyes actually see. But I mean, I think to have this sort of raw nature, and I was very fortunate that I studied photography and learned in, in that world. And I think what I hear today is a lot of schools that do teach photography, they will start the students with film cameras. So they learn how to take a picture versus let the, let the technology do it for them. <laughs> So, John Lando goes and writes his review in uh, the real paper. He writes the article called Growing Young with Rock and Roll. Now, John Lando had been writing reviews. John Lando has been doing a little record producing as well. He was a little, he was a little jaded with uh, the music scene. But even though this review is, is very famous for its, for its line, I saw Rock and Roll Future, his name is Bruce Springsteen, the review itself is a love letter to rock and roll. What the review was really about 
how he was losing faith in rock music, about how he thought it was at its end. And suddenly he saw this act. And it wasn't so much, when he writes this, it wasn't so much that he saw the future of rock and roll and it's Bruce Springsteen, but he saw that rock and roll had a future. And Bruce Springsteen to him proves it to him. Of course, he's now his manager, and that's worked out pretty well for both of them. But, you know, when this re review came out and this line came out, the record companies got a hold of it and they said, aha, we've got something we can work with now. And suddenly they're putting ads out everywhere. He goes to perform and they're using the quote here and there everywhere. And suddenly new life has been breathed into the label, into the artist, his man. The, company, the record label now is out there promoting him more. They're getting the albums to the stores and they're basically investing him heavily now and allowing him. And now they're going, because basically the next album was going to be his last album. They said, okay. You know, we have faith, faith in you again. So things definitely worked out well after that night. You know, good for him, good for all of us who have enjoyed his music. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's always interesting is they, always, they still look back on this and they know that was a tough thing to live up to. But as Bruce has said in days since, that um, if somebody had to be the future of rock and roll, it might have well have been me. And what's inter and also that I'm always surprised because where the book that I did is really based upon this evening on this very famous quote, and I've always thought this was kind of history, it still surfaces, you know. They don't we we've had some conversations with John Lando, you know, about the book and whatever, and he often said, Oh, I've talked about it enough, I've talked about it enough. But then every so often I see him, yeah, right, yeah, the future rock and roll. I was there, I saw the night, so it's it it hasn't worn thin on them yet. Um but, you know, fortunate, you know, for them, and actually fortunate for me, I was able to, you know, uh, pick up later, years later, and continue the relationship. You know, I mentioned that I was able to go out and, and be part of the uh, 2016 tour. Um, some shots here from, uh, from, the, from the garden. I don't know if any of you saw any of the tour. So this was, this was in Hartford, and uh, this was in uh, New York City. Um, during Rosalita, just they're hamming it up on stage, it was great. And this is kind of a, I just love this shot. And I was, I was very, very thrilled that they actually used it on the website for a while, you know, which was kind of cool. Um, but I was able to be there at the Gillette show as well, which, um, this is from the Gillette show, which was the, I think it was the best show on the tour. And a lot of people connected with the group agree with it as well. It was the last night of the U.S. leg. So it was like, you know, their, their finale. And you're right, because he was playing all the stuff from the first two albums, which is the music that I first got introduced to him as, and hearing, and, you know, you hear a song here and there, but I never heard almost the entire album being played. It's just, it's just incredible. They just didn't want to stop, stop this. Oh, yeah, New York Serenade. And what, what I loved about it is here they are, opening up a New York Serenade. To me, it was kind of like, you know, great. You know, 40 plus years later, I'm back, and they're opening up with the same number. I saw them open up, open up in 74, you know. I mean, just still full, full of passion, full of just love. Incredible night for music. And, and again, you know, the interaction between the, the, art, the musicians on stage, you know, uh, Bruce and Jake, just, you know, still, still playing like it's, they're still working hard, still trying to make it work, you know, um, him, him and Steven as well, you know, just enjoying each other on night. When I saw them, the first night, the first show I was on on the tour was the first, man, the first uh, New York City show at Madison Square Garden. I think that was my, maybe three or four nights in the tour. I did a lot of the Northeast area with them. And I, and I hadn't seen the band in a while. I saw them um, on a couple of tours earlier. But at this point now, I sort of had reestablished relationship with people connected with the band, and I was getting you know, access again and doing photography with backstreets, people like that. So I was very fortunate that I was you know, in the pit every night. And when you're down there, it's a whole different perspective. And I, I remember calling Mari and saying, you know, I said, it was great. I said, it's a bunch of people our age having the time of their lives, you know, which is what it was. I mean, they're just out there just having fun. And, and it is. And it's just, you know, they are. They, they work hard every night. They are exhausted every night. I don't know how they can do it. They're not going to be doing it much longer, you know, because it's a lot. But, uh, you know, it was, you know, it was, it, it's still an incredible thing. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is when he was on his book tour. And that's when they came to Cambridge at the uh, Harvey Coop, you know, and uh, I, was, I was over there taking some shots there that night. But, you know, I've been fortunate again to, you know, continue to do some work with them and some of the individuals, you know, because, um, 
you know, like I said, he, when Landau wrote the review, he wrote it about his love for music and love for rock and roll and how the street still existed. Um, I did a talk at Emerson College a few, couple of years ago, same thing, to students, you know, who were studying rock music. It was a rock journalism class. And the, the, the teacher, who was a journalist and, a, and an author, told the kids what was so amazing about rock and roll, as he said, because when the genre first came out, people thought maybe it had 10 years and there'd be something new. Nobody thought it still would be going on today. Now, that was just surprising to everybody. Um, and again, you know, lucky to sort of spend some time with the band members. Uh, Gary Talent here, who's got a great, uh, he, he's in Nashville, does a lot of producing, uh, really into the whole kind of, he's really into a very hillbilly style of music. Um, this is when he has uh, the band from Break Time, which is a great, great band. I mean, these are some of the best local musicians in Nashville. And he also produces now a lot. He just produced an album, a group called the Delevantes which is great stuff, you know, great classic Nashville singer-songwriter brother, brother team. Uh, Jay Clemens, who I mentioned, you know, the, uh, this is uh, when he was, came here recently, not recently, but this was 2000, I think it was, must have been right after, yeah, right after the uh, River Tour around 2017, 2018, they went back out on their, on their own thing. Um, my favorite, little Steven, you know, who's got a hell of a show. Um, we, we saw him the second time he came around uh, in Medford, and his, and his whole show, the whole act, I mean, he's, you know, he's got a, it's a 14 piece band, uh, full horn section, uh, great, great group of uh, background vocalists. I mean, it's an amazing show. It's just a night of R&B. And he's, a, he's literally a music historian. I was, you know, I was talking to Andrew about this later because he has the book here. Um, he is, and if you ever listen to him on his radio channel on Sirius, Little Stevens Underground, his knowledge of music and the roots of music and how this type of music, how street corner music evolved into, you know, a cappella involved into R&B. I mean, he's just a wealth of knowledge, incredibly nice guy, you know, and just, just loves music. Um, another great person, Niels Lofgren, the, you know, the guitarist, the man, really wonderful guy, really sweet guy. Um, did some work with him, and I was actually kind of lucky that we shot some stuff when they were here, City Winery in Boston, which uh, he used on his, uh, his latest album, uh, Weathered, which is his live album from the tour. Uh, really, really nice stuff. Um, you know, and, and it's funny because in, all, in a lot of the photos I've taken over the years with him, th this still tends to be one of my favorites because this, to me, this to me says what rock and roll is. It's just this look in people's eyes and his face and the connection that happens here that um, is ju it's just amazing to me. It's just, and again, I said I was watching that show last night, the, uh, <clears throat> the No Nukes concert, and the energy is just, is there. It's just, there's just nothing like it. And, you know, it's been, it's been a gas. Uh, photographing Bruce Springsteen, it's also a lot of fun being photographed with Bruce Springsteen. You know? So, yeah, we were, we were fortunate we got invited down to uh, the Springsteen on Broadway show. And, uh, it, I, mean, I mean, if you haven't seen this, you didn't get to see the show, you know, it's on Netflix. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing, you know, that this guy who does the show, who writes an autobiography, and then goes on Broadway. And, um, and one of the things that, I, you know, that was always kind of, I always remember it was kind of fun that night was, you know, music on stars, and he's probably about as big as you can get, you know, will typically have entourages and all this people all around them and all these things. So we're, you know, so we were at the show and, and Barbara, one of his managers, you know, we go backstage with her afterwards and we're just chatting with some people. So there's a few, you know, a small handful of people and it's, it's New York City, it's a theater, so everything's small. We're in a small little room and we're just talking and he just kind of walks in by himself, just like, hey, how you doing? And literally just spends time with everybody there talking a few things. There was a, uh, Counting Crows. The people from the band Counting Crows were there. And he's talking to them. What are you guys up to these days? And he's just, he's treating everybody, you know, like, he, like you know him. You know, like he wants to know what you're up to. You know, oh, he's talking about the photos of the Garfield Square Theater. Yeah, there's great stuff, like this stuff. I, you know, I know he does some photography himself, so I was talking to him about some of the work he's been doing, you know. And, uh, you know, it was really kind of just really pleasurable to, you know, kind of have that experience. And, uh, and luckily he's going uh, to, continue to come back on the road this spring we're, we're hearing about, so uh, we're all looking forward to that. Thank you.